Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. We're again visiting the Dell Optiplex here in this second video featuring this desktop PC. And in today's video, we're gonna spice things up a bit and we're going to give the PC some additional multimedia functionality because it is a bit boring at the moment. There's also no room to add a CD-ROM drive at the moment, so we're gonna change that as well. But first, a word from our sponsor. And this video is sponsored by PCBWay, a full-feature custom PCB prototyping service. If you need PCB prototypes, SMD stencils, PCB assembly, flexible PCBs or advanced PCBs, PCBWay has got you covered. Shipping to more than 170 countries worldwide, processing thousands of PCB orders a day, PCBWay combines excellent pricing with excellent customer service. Check out their website to get a quote or get in touch with their friendly support staff if you have any more questions. But now back to the video. So the first thing we're gonna be doing is removing that hard drive caddy. So I'm gonna be moving the disk drive out of the way so that we can easily access the hard drive caddy. Like I said, I don't really have much use for it. I did receive a lot of comments from the previous video that the reason why the hard drive probably wasn't working is because I didn't have the key for the caddy and it turned out that that was indeed correct. So yeah, tiny screw up on my part, but luckily I have lots of knowledgeable viewers that can help out here. But yeah, I don't really have a use for that because I am going to put in a CD-ROM drive. So I have found this uh, Mitsumi uh, CD-ROM. It's actually a CD rewritable uh, drive, but I'm not going to be writing any CDs here. I'm just going to be trying to see if it works because I have a bag full of these CD-ROM drives. It's always a bit difficult to find out if they're still working. So I'm going to be attaching it to the second IDE channel and I'm going to be using my Windows 95 boot disk to boot into the Windows 95 startup menu, which will allow me to load up a CD-ROM driver. And I'm gonna go for the NEC IDE CD-ROM drive and it picks up the CD-ROM drive. Now it didn't pick up the CD-ROM drive at first and that can have, you know, multiple reasons. I mean, the CD-ROM drive could be bad, the jumpers on the CD-ROM drive could be bad, but in my particular case, it was actually the CMOS settings which were preventing the CD-ROM drive from being loaded. As you can see here, the primary and the secondary drives were set to none, and that didn't allow for the CD-ROM drive to be detected. But after fixing that, I was able to access the CD-ROM drive. And first thing I'm gonna do is create a Win95 folder on the hard drive, go to the D drive, which is the CD-ROM drive. As you can see here, it loads up the Windows 95 disk beautifully. I can access the files. I'm gonna copy all of the install files onto my C drive because Windows 95 has this bad habit of sometimes not loading the CD-ROM driver once it goes into the second phase of the installation. So for that reason, I like to copy it to the hard drive. It's also a good test to see if both the CD and the CD-ROM drive are working. But you know, I was able to copy all the files onto the hard drive, no issue. Uh, it still was booting into MS-DOS 6.22 because I originally set up the hard drive using my MS-DOS 6.22 disks. And as I was doing the setup, I thought this was going to be a breeze, but all of a sudden I got this. Standard mode fault in MS-DOS extender. And I mean, that's sometimes the thing with these retro machines. Some things as trivial as installing a Windows 95 can sometimes cause you a world of pain. Now, in this particular case, apparently it was due to the fact that my hard drive was set up using MS-DOS 6.22 and apparently the Windows 95 installer had an issue with that. So after repartitioning and reformatting the hard drive using my Windows 95 boot disk, I was able to start the Windows 95 setup. So yeah, I'm not really sure what that is about because I would imagine that it should be possible to install Windows 95 as kind of an upgrade path to an MS-DOS 6.22 system, but apparently this was causing issues. Now I wasn't able to run scan disk because I didn't have an extended memory manager installed, but we can bypass the scan disk and then just go into the Windows 95 setup. So yeah, at this point I was pretty happy. I knew that the CD-ROM drive was working. I knew I could 
transfer the files onto the hard drive and I should be able to do a Windows 95 setup. So time to put the CD-ROM drive into this Dell proprietary bracket and close up the machine. So here we are, everything closed up, the CD-ROM drive installed, the Windows 95 setup started. It's always a nice feeling to install a Windows 95 operating system on actual old hardware. I mean, I'm all for virtual machines to try stuff out and getting things done really quickly, but I mean, there's just something about listening to the hard drive rattle and these progress bars slowly making their way to 100%, not really knowing what they're actually doing. You also get this sense of speed or lack thereof associated with installing an operating system on an old machine like this. I mean, it does take a fair bit to get everything installed and it does require multiple reboots before the operating system is ready for use. The advantage of course is that you do get the time to read these kind of infographics here during the Windows setup. And you also get to experience the nice sounds that the hard drive produces as it is installing windows 95 on this machine it's all part of the charm of working with these retro computers i guess and as i said earlier just as you think that the windows 95 setup is completed it is rebooting to start windows 95 for the first time but it just continues on with the installation But then finally, after about 30 minutes, which actually felt like 30 hours, you are ready to restart the computer and restart Windows 95 for the very first time to boot into that wonderful Windows 95 desktop. I mean, I love looking at this Microsoft Windows 95 splash screen. I love the sound of the hard drive as it is spinning up the operating system, launching you into this Windows 95 desktop. The color of the desktop already reveals that it has detected your graphics card, in this case the S3 Trio 64V+. Not a real uh, gaming demon, but it should do for this Intel Pentium 133 MHz, but we will explore some other options in a future video. But for now, I'm happy that we have launched into the Windows 95 desktop. So let's launch the computer properties. Pentium, 16 megabytes of RAM. Let's go into the device manager. We have the Mitsumi CD-ROM drive. We have the display adapter, the S3 Trio 64V+. Standard floppy disk controller, hard disk controllers. Standard keyboard. And if we look at the other devices, we see that our PCI Ethernet controller is not properly initialized because we need to update the driver for this one. So let's go ahead and do that first. So let's navigate to that PCI Ethernet controller, go into the driver tab, hit update driver, make sure that we have our floppy disk at hand containing the real tech drivers because these aren't supported by default in windows 95 but then it should find the drivers as you can see here realtek rtl 8029 let's hit finish we need to provide a computer name and a workgroup name i'm going to be calling this the optiplex 133 we're going to put it in the work group and then you know one of the quirks of windows 95 is that here it prompts you for the exact directory location on the floppy disk where the driver is located something that it didn't need at first but you know it's just one of these quirks one of these technicalities that you need to be aware of when installing these these uh, peripherals which aren't supported uh, by default but then here we get the network, the Microsoft networking prompt. We need to set a password. 
and then hopefully we can get on the network but I mean having the network card detected properly is just step one because step two involves uh, adding the necessary protocol so I'm going to be installing Microsoft TCP IP enable uh, Microsoft file and print sharing I'm going to disable the netware support and then another reboot is required in order to get this machine properly onto the network with TCP IP getting an IP address from the network and allowing us to browse the network neighborhood and as you can see here it has found another uh, couple of devices and on my NAS box here we can see that we can access it now I have a couple of games here which I can copy onto this machine so I guess we're good to go now and it's a really humbling experience to you know start copying files from the network onto this PC giving the high speed internet access and network access that we have at our disposal today I mean copying a file which is only a couple of tens of megabytes in size does take a substantial amount of time also the fact that you only have an 800 megabyte hard drive is pretty limiting because I can access my NAS box which probably contains every MS-DOS game ever made so you need to be a bit picky at what games you choose also decompressing zip files and stuff like that CPU intensive stuff does take a while on this computer but yeah once we have that we can load up some games but you probably notice that we have one other thing missing and that is a little bit of sound because obviously it's nice that we can play these games here but without a sound card and speakers it is pretty dull although I am pretty sure that a lot of these machines back in the day were used to play games without any sound but that's not what we're going to be doing here because what I have here is this little box of sound cards that I'm going to be exploring so I'm going to go for a 16-bit ISA sound card. I have a couple of them here, some from Creative, like the AW64. I have an AW32. Uh, but for this particular machine, I'm probably going to be going for not this one. This is, I think, an M-Wave sound card. But I do like this Sound Blaster 16, which is kind of an iconic uh, card and I'm probably gonna go with that one I have a couple of other ones this is an 8-bit uh, sound blaster also have one of these uh, cheaper uh, vibra ones more low-cost cars from creative they're not really bad but I think it's uh, would be nice to get this uh, sound blaster 16 up and running so yeah time to open up the computer once more and get that sound blaster installed now the thing we need to do here is remove that riser card and i'm probably going to be removing this modem card here which takes up a 16-bit isa slot i don't really have any use for it so modem goes out sound blaster 16 goes in it's a pretty long card so it will not fit in every computer but luckily this desktop case is large enough I have hooked up some speakers and let's find out how easy it is to get this sound blaster 16 up and running on this Dell Optiplex there should be default or standard support in Windows 95 for this sound card but it's obviously not being picked up automatically we need to go into the control panel go into the add new hardware application which has this feature that it can scan your computer for new hardware it takes a very long time there's a lot of disk activity going on uh, while it is trying to detect new hardware in your computer and after a while it gets to 100% and then hopefully it should be able to find your specific sound card. As is the case here because after the detection progress has reached 100% we can go into details and it has found our Creative Lab Sound Blaster 16 and the game port joystick. So drivers are included on the Windows 95 CD-ROM drive that we have copied over to our hard drive so you don't need to look for any additional drivers this should just work out of the box so after it has done copying the drivers let's go into the system here 
go into device manager and under the sound video and game controllers we can see our sound blaster we get the playback and the recording devices we can put the volume controls here and then first thing i always do is find a wave file to play just to see if the sound is working now there should be something on the c drive here the microsoft sound let's give it a try sounds good to me so yeah let's load up one of those games that i showed you earlier oh man sure looks and sounds a lot better now so yeah i guess we're off to a pretty good start here we've got the nice visuals here we have the sound blasting through the speakers so yeah, I'm guessing this little Dell Optiplex here with the Intel Pentium 133 MHz CPU is ready to experience some serious DOS and Windows 95 gaming. Also wanted to raise the bar a little bit with a little bit more of a demanding game like Quake, which has a minimum system requirement of an Intel Pentium 75 megahertz, so this 133 megahertz should do just fine. It is a very low uh, graphics, obviously, but I mean, that's the way we play this game. I mean, we weren't hung up over maximum resolutions or any frames per second. I mean, for us, this was perfect playable and resulted in hours of fun. So yeah, that's all I've got time for in this video. I'm actually on holiday, but I did want to get this video out and also a follow-up video where I will be exploring some other video options, see what other upgrade paths we have with this PC in terms of CPU and memory, and also explore some different sound options. But for now, I really hope you've enjoyed this one. I think we turned this little Dell Optiplex office machine into a nice little MS-DOS slash Windows 95 gaming machine. If you like this video, please consider dropping a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so, and I really hope to see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.